in, in, in my uh, chair's introduction, he mentioned that we'd be focusing a lot on issues pertaining to the global social justice movement. And in the course of actually preparing, um, there is a preponderance of doom and gloom and looking at what's going wrong with the world. And only a little bit at the end talking about the positive things that we can do. But hopefully in the Q&A session we'll be having an opportunity to talk about that. <clears throat> so I'm going to start by kind of focusing on the title that we've got. The idea of the Holocaust, which as we all know, is traditionally used to refer to the systematic, bureaucratic, state-sponsored persecution and mass murder of the Jews by Nazi Germany during the Second World War. And as you can see, the word Holocaust is originally a Greek word, which means sacrifice by fire. It conveys an event, the scale and horror of which transformed the course of world history, as we're all aware. Moreover, it's often seen as a crime against humanity, but it's unparalleled and unique. This, none of us dispute. The Nazi Holocaust was indeed a uniquely horrific genocide, whose enormity and systematic character is barely imaginable. In this context, you might want to know, what do I mean when I talk about the hidden Holocaust? That's the title of today's event. But I'm not using the term in a strict academic sense at the moment. I'm trying to use it to convey the sense of what's going on today, and what's been going on in our history. What you might kind of see is a campaign of global homicide, whose scale and enormity is very, very difficult to convey in words. <clears throat> I also use the term hidden holocaust specifically to convey the idea that this campaign is actually hidden from our perceptions. It's something that is not very easy to see. It's less visible. It's something that if you want to understand it, you need to scratch the surface of what's going on, not just today, but also historically. Its reality, though, is very real. Very real for millions of people around the world, both historically and today but it remains officially unacknowledged. I'm going to focus on the 20th and 21st centuries in terms of talking about how this hidden historical holocaust is now escalating into a global holocaust even as we speak. I'm going to talk about expert projections from different disciplines in the social sciences and physical sciences on the, the really, really worrying trends that are going on now, which may even culminate, according to some of the most prominent experts, culminate in the extinction of our species, and perhaps even all life on Earth. And this is where we get to the second part of my title, Our Civilizational Crisis. That picture's real, by the way. No, I'm just kidding, it's not. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> fake. <picture. laughs> um, so we often hear that civilization is a word that's kind of bandied about a lot. Um, and it's often used to explain the dynamics of the war on terror. And I've got a quote here from Tony Blair earlier this year where he's used the term. And um, actually his, his use of the term came from um, an academic theory of international relations. You've probably heard of it, the Clash of Civilizations thesis that was originally put forward by Samuel Huntington, who was a Harvard professor and a government advisor, who said that you know, the war on terror is basically an almost inevitable clash between these two civilizational camps, you know, Islam and West. And what Tony Blair has done is really kind of just amended this a little bit, um, but really kind of solidified the meaning to say that it's not just a case of you've got these two civilizations on an equal playing field now kind of, kind of, you know, inevitably confronting, is that one of these civilizations represents this reactionary, semi-feudal, backward existence, whereas our civilization represents progress, modernity. But my argument today is that this hidden holocaust that I'm talking about is not an aberration from our advanced civilization that represents, you know, like the peak of human development. On the contrary, I'm arguing that this hidden holocaust is integral to the very structure of the values and activities of this civilization as it currently stands. And unless we attempt to transform the nature of this civilization, we may well perish in a holocaust of our own making. 
So I'm going to have a bit of a history lesson here. I want to start with looking at the Holocaust in history. When did it start? And why and how? Well, it started at the beginning of what you might see as modern civilization itself. The origins of modern civilization can be found to some extent in the voyages of European colonial expansion and trade from around the 15th century all the way to the 19th century. It was a very disparate process. Different powers died at different times. You had so many different countries involved, Spain, Italy, uh, the Portuguese, the English, many other explorers ventured out from their home countries in search of new wealth and new land in all corners of the globe. They went to the continents of America, Africa and Asia, they set up colonies, they set up trading outposts. Now these guys, these colonists, these settlers, they had all sorts of intentions. Some of them had money and they wanted to invest it, they wanted to find new, new opportunities. Others, they had lives of real hardship in their home countries and they, and they were looking for something different. They wanted a fresh start. Others wanted to deliver the message of Christianity to these native populations. But all of, almost all of them identified what they were doing with this, with this inexorable march of progress. They saw themselves as spreading a distinctive form of development to other parts of the world, bringing the fruits of European civilization to what were kind of automatically seen as backward peoples. And whatever the intentions, European expansion involved massive systematic violence. It involved violence of all kinds. And I've got a quote there from a well-known historian who just observes that colonialism as it was conducted in history was invariably linked with genocide. Genocide was almost systematically linked with colonialism. This wasn't the result of some grand plan. Sorry, I'm not sure what that is. Um, but it was the result of very, very kind of haphazard interests which faced resistance from native populations. I'm briefly going to go through a couple of examples of what happened in our history. Starting with the continent of, the, of, of America, which we know the year 1492, when Columbus originally ventured out and he, just, and he, he was reputed to have discovered the continent. Now between the 15th and 18th centuries, the Spanish and also the English, as well as the French and a number of other different um, European countries, began to encroach further and further in land into America. And in the course of attempting to control that country, that continent, they created huge devastation. Whole civilizations collapsed as a direct consequence of colonization. Now, there's a number of studies that, that, that have explored this issue. And I've got that one book there, which was a landmark book by David Stannard, who is a historian in the United States. And this is how he described it. He said, at the dawn of the 15th century, Spanish conquerors and priests presented the Indians they encountered with a choice. Either give up your religion and culture and land and independence, swearing allegiance as vassals to the Catholic Church and the Spanish crown, or suffer, and he quotes, all the mischief and damage, unquote, that the European invaders choose to inflict upon you. And I've given a, a, a ballpark figure there, but I mean, the breakdown of the figures is, is really huge. I mean, 11 million people lost their lives in, in Mexico. The Andean Empire of the Incas, you had 8 million Native Americans lost their lives. The Portuguese conquest um, in north of Mexico took 2.5 million lives. And the list goes on and on. 50 million is probably the most reliable figure. 100 million are, are, is, is slightly more speculative. Now moving to another continent, I focused on the impact of the slave trade. Now obviously the slave trade did exist in Africa before the Europeans went there, but it wasn't, didn't exist on, this, on, the, on the systematic and global scale which it came to once the Europe, Europeans basically took control of, 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 of the coastal areas of Africa 
and began shipping out dozens and dozens and dozens of Africans day by day. This really lasted a long, long, it was a protracted period of the five centuries. And there, there's a lot of debate over how many people actually died in this process. But Rommel, RJ Rommel, is one of these scholars who has this penchant, this deep passion for statistics. If you look at his book, Death by Government, it's literally just a compendium of statistics of governments that have basically killed people. And it's a really, really harrowing read, but he's very, very meticulous. And that's his estimate, that in five centuries, you had a minimum of 17 million Africans dying. Now, the way they died, obviously, was, was different. Some, a number of Africans were killed in the process of the colonialists trying to basically enforce them into the slave trade. The second way in which they died was when they were transported across the Atlantic Ocean in these really, really harsh conditions. They didn't have access to food, didn't have access to water. They were, they were basically um, suffering from um, diseases and they weren't cared for whatsoever. Millions of people died on that journey alone. Finally, once they arrived in the American continent, they were worked to death on largely cotton plantations and other kind of uh, enterprises. And the important thing that I would like us to remember about this process is it, it, its systematic character. Many of the people involved in this were not evil people. They didn't set out to be evil, but they accepted what they were doing because they, they had these elaborate ideologies of justification. And this is what is very worrying, is that really terrible things often happen with the best of intentions. The other thing I want us to remember is how this contributed to civilization. There's a sociologist at the University of Essex by the name of Robert Blackburn who did a study of the relationship between the emergence of capitalism and industrialization and slavery. This was an old argument that people will still be debating now, but he argued that the profits of slavery between Europe, Africa, and America contributed fundamentally to Britain's industrialization. He said the profits from the trade for 1770 would have provided between 20 to 55% of Britain's gross fixed capital formation, which was then, went, was then invested in industrialization. That is a very, very disturbing allegation because it suggests, again, that violence, systematic violence was somehow integral to our development, to our advancement. This is no less true than for the example of India. Again, not very well known. But there was a landmark study that was done by a British historian here by the name of Mike Davis, published in 2001 called Late Victorian Holocausts. And what he did, he showed how British imperial free market policies in India converted climatic events in South Asia, consisting of droughts, and also South Africa into these really, really deadly famines. The droughts certainly would have led to deaths on, on, on a small scale. I think that's really. But um, it would not have led to this massive systematic scale of death. And he, he uses India as one of his prominent case, case studies, and he argues that between 5.5 and 12 million people died in what was essentially an artificially induced famine, where millions of tons of grain were actually in commercial circulation. He shows that India had basically become this satellite country for Britain's industrialization. Britain was industrializing. They needed to, all the agricultural, most of the agricultural land was now being used for industry. So they needed to have more imports for food. And so India became this, this basically the source of, 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 of food. It fed England. And what he says is basically Londoners were in effect eating India's bread. Just to give you an example, between 1877 and 1878, grain merchants exported a record 6.4 million hundred weights of wheat to Europe, while millions of Indian poor starved to death. So Davis's conclusion is again very harrowing, very worrying. 
he says that these people didn't kind of die as, as a kind of an, as a, some, some kind of accident of history. Many British officials knew what was going on. He goes through the documents. He gives quote after quote of officials, colonial administrators, justifying the mass death of Indians at that time. So he concludes that these people didn't die outside the modern world system. They died as part of the emergence of this world system. <clears throat> so my argument is that this violence was not merely accidental to the European imperial project. It was integral to it. And by that, I don't mean that European settlers and colonists kind of set out to become murderous killers. Of course they didn't, by no means. As I said, many of them set out with the best of intentions. But in the course of their imperial projects, murderous killing became increasingly necessary if the interests of European colonies were to be sustained. When the natives increasingly resisted European interference to exert control over their land, colonists responded with force. And this system basically accelerated between 1870 and 1914, when you've heard of the scramble for Africa, where you know, there, was, there was a kind of renewed piece of life given to these colonial imperatives. During that period, almost the entire world essentially came under the control of the European empires. Britain, France, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Belgium, the USA, and Japan. Just as an example, between themselves in Africa, for example, they acquired 30 new colonies and 110 million subjects. <clears throat> I've given just one example there of how this impacted economically in a global scale. People talk about globalization. Globalization began in this process. It was a long historical process. It wasn't something that just began in the 1970s, as we're often kind of told. It was something that began many centuries ago. And this, we can see even features of it that we criticize now, we can see features of it going on then. And the examples I gave there is per capita income for developed Europe compared to the colonies. In 1880, Europe had doubled the per capita income of most of the South or the Third World. By 1913, it was three times as much, and by 1950, it was five times as much. Similarly, the per capita share of GNP in the industrialized countries of the developed European core was in 1830 already twice as much, already double. By 1913, it became seven times as high. So this was a system which fundamentally marginalized and subjugated certain parts of the world to the interest of the European core. Now, fast track, we skip the second, the, the World War, we fast track to 1945, the end of the Second World War, and the dawn of a new post-war international order. Now, obviously, as the Second World War was coming to an end, people were thinking that the United States, in particular, as well as Britain, were kind of thinking, what are we going to do once we, once we, there was, they, they thought they would win the war, pretty much. They knew they had overwhelming military strength. They were trying to think, how would we reconstruct the post-war international order? And so what you have here, I've got a photo there of the Council of Foreign Relations, and a little logo from the State Department. And in, in the 1940s, the State Department got together with the Council of Foreign Relations, and they started thinking, how are they going to do this? They, they got together the academics and the policymakers and started laying down their plans. And pretty much, they consciously decided that the, the, world, the order that they would construct would actually be an imperial order. And the interesting thing is, is that today, I mean, most politicians today would not know this. They wouldn't be aware of this. They would just be like, how could you say that this is an imperial system? But in, 1940, in the 1940s, they knew they were designing an imperial system. They were doing it consciously. <coughs> Some of them may have even had some good intentions. But pretty much what they were thinking about was how to maintain US power at this particular time. And I want to give a couple of other quotes just to give, a, give you an idea of how this worked. Grand area strategy was basically premised on this idea that if you wanted to maintain global control, 
there were certain areas of the world that you needed to dominate. If you didn't dominate those areas, you wouldn't have you wouldn't have global control. So you identified these areas, and those, that area that overall was called the Grand Area. And the Grand Area consisted of the entire Western Hemisphere, the former British Empire, all the colonies of the British Empire, and, and the Far East. And they said that the economic control over this area was, quote, essential for the security and economic prosperity of the United States and the Western Hemisphere. So in other words, dominating these areas was essential simply to have security and economic prosperity. Perfectly legitimate end, you might think. But what this meant, quite interestingly, was that they had to, quote, secure the limitation of any exercise of sovereignty by foreign nations that constitute a threat to this world area. Think about that. The limitation of any exercise of sovereignty of foreign nations that may constitute a threat. In other words, if a sovereign nation decides to do something that may threaten our domination of these areas, then we have to limit that sovereignty. So all of these ideas that we're hearing now in the war on terror about you know, sovereignty being something that we can sacrifice for the sake of security, these are not new ideas. These are, kind of, these are really old ideas. In fact, this goes back centuries. <coughs> And it was in that context that when State Department planners and British planners were looking at what was going on across the global south, when disparate movements in Africa and Asia were rising up for national independence, they were saying, we want freedom from colonial rule. We want the right to self-determination. They didn't want that. They were coming up with plans that would allow them to effectively neuter all of these movements. And I have that quote there from D.K. Fieldhouse. D.K. Fieldhouse is a very, very reputed historian and, and a renowned expert on imperial history. And he acknowledges that this is exactly what happened. The idea was to reconfigure the empire. They couldn't control directly anymore using direct force. Direct military occupation was too costly and too difficult. People were uprising against it, so they had to do something else. Economic dependence. In other words, you recede and you set up these surrogate client regimes that will operate in your interest without you having to be there, without you having to show your face and say, this is my land. No. These are independent lands, and we have given them freedom. But actually, they were economically dependent on, on the British and American powers. <clears throat> and in many ways, the Cold War was really the history of attempts to shut down decolonization. We had over 70 military interventions in the post-war period, from 1945 to 1990. <clears throat> and as we know, most of these were supposed to be countering Soviet expansionism. But this idea suggests that perhaps it wasn't a really about countering Soviet expansionism. Maybe it was about actually trying to establish control over regions of the world that were trying to cause the national independence. And interestingly, a number of actual American officials who worked in the government at the time have actually come out and said that this is exactly what was happening that the Cold War, the existence of the Soviet Union, of course the Soviet Union was a threat. It, the bipolar system did exist. It limited the ability of the United States and Western Europe to do many, many things. But was it the fundamental motivating factor in the Cold War? According to Richard Barnett, it was, Richard Barnett is a, was a State Department official in the 1950s, and he said that even the word communist has been applied so liberally and so loosely to revolutionary and radical regimes that any government risks being so characterized if it adopts any of the following policies. And he gives this list. Nationalization of private industry, particularly foreign-owned corporations. Radical land reform. 
or target trade policy, or independent trade policy, accepting some Soviet or Chinese aid, insistence upon following an anti-American or non-aligned foreign policy, among others. <coughs> so in other words, whether it was through ideology, through blind paranoia, or through ruthless real politics, the reality was, was that what we were doing from 1945 to 1990 was crushing national independence movements around the world. And there was another State Department official, called William Blum, ex-State Department official, who was there for a few years before he left, he felt disillusioned. And he wrote a book called Killing Hope, uh, CIA and US military intervention since 1945. It's this fat book, and he goes through literally case by case by case, country by country analysis based on declassified documents, mainstream press reports, and what we were doing, what the US and the CIA were doing in this period. And he says in the introduction to his book, he says this was, he called it, he dubs it the American Holocaust. <clears throat> How many innocent civilians died as a consequence of these military interventions? There's been a number of people who've tried to kind of actually estimate the figures. I thought I had them there. <laughs> I don't have them, I forgot that. I'm going to, I'll, I'll just quote a few. According to Mark Curtis, if you want to look this up, Mark Curtis is a British historian. He's got two books, On People and Web of Deceit, that I would strongly recommend. Um, and he actually has, he's got a, a list of table at, tables at the end of his book where he, he does a kind of comprehensive breakdown. Um, but it, my actual figure comes from a guy called J.W. Smith, who he worked at the Institute for Economic Democracy in, in Arizona. And he says that it's about 12 to 15 million people who died from 1945 to 1990 when you calculate the direct deaths from military interventions. What he then says is that there are unknown numbers of people who died as an indirect consequence of these interventions in terms of the socio-economic policies of the regimes that were then installed. And he goes, you can only estimate these upwards of 100 million. Over 100 million is, is, is a reasonable estimate. Now this is shocking. These figures are not part of our historical consciousness. We do not identify these figures with the advance of modernity. And I think that says that there is something seriously wrong with our understanding of, of history. And I wanted to close by just giving a brief example of the kind of Holocaust type events that are going on today with Iraq. We don't look at Iraq as a Holocaust. But I'm minded, just looking at the death toll figures, to think that maybe it is. Maybe this is really something which tells us there is something deeply wrong with our civilization when an event like this can be actually justified in the name of security. <clears throat> Now we can run through the figures there. The first figure, 150,000, was actually was done. Uh, the study was done by a woman who worked in the U.S. Department of Commerce, and when she produced these figures, she was fired because they said these figures can't be right. But she went along and she actually published them in a peer-reviewed journal. The U.N. sanctions regime again; these figures are not disputed. 1.7 million civilians died. Now the fact is is that one can debate over what the intent was, but it's pretty clear that the UN sanctions regime and the officials who set it up, people in, in the US government and the British government, they pretty much were aware of the impact of their policies. And just to give an example from Robert Gates, Robert Gates is currently the US Defense Secretary, and he said this as president, presidential national advisor, security, national security advisor to the first Bush administration in 1991, he said, Iraqis will pay the price while Saddam is in power. And that was his reference to the impact of the sanctions regime. And the last figure is 1.2 million civilians according to OBR. Now what's, obviously you've probably heard of the, Johns Hop, the John Hopkins University public School of Public Health study, which estimated that it was about um, over 600,000 Iraqis had died 
Now their data set, if you extend it to today, also implies that the casualties are about one million. Now what happened is that the OBR, they did a survey by interviewing, they went into Iraq and they, they did face-to-face -face interviews with Iraqis on the ground, over a thousand of them. And they asked them how many people have died as a result of, of, of the, the, the coalition intervention. And this is how they came up with their figure. I think it was 1,720 adults over 18. And that was where they came, they came up with this figure. Now all of these are statistical studies. Now what, but, you know, these are scientific studies that by normal standards, if you applied them in everyday life, would not be questioned. But when it comes to Iraq, and you look at the state of the debate in the mainstream media, these figures are not given currency. These figures are debatable. These statistical methodologies suddenly become highly questionable. And when it comes to issues like, you know, car crashes and things like that, no, they, they work fine, we don't need to question them. But just so you know, the Ministry of Defence actually um, quietly told its officials not to criticise um, the John Hopkins study in public because they said the findings were robust. So they know that, that they're robust. <clears throat> the total people who died in Iraq, if you add that up, over, over, from 1991 is 3 million people. That's half the people, they're told, from, from, from the Jewish Holocaust. That is shocking. So that's part two out of the way. That's looking at the kind of historical direct military angle. Now what I want to talk about is what is happening today. And there are four key areas that I want to discuss, as you can see. And um, what I'm going to try and do is select some of the most pertinent data, some of the most well-known data. Obviously, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a physical scientist myself. Um, but I'm going to try and select the most pertinent stuff that is least questionable from the scientific evidence on all of these issues and try and build up a picture of what is likely to happen to the world if we do not change our current course. Starting on the issue of climate catastrophe. Now as we know, this is an industrial civilization. But what do we mean by that? It means that we derive all our energy, essentially, from fossil fuels. Fossil fuels, the burning of fossil fuels, obviously pumps carbon dioxide, CO2, into the atmosphere. And it's those CO2 emissions that are, according to the scientific, the conventional scientific argument, the primary, the primary force that is driving climate change. These industries, they drive our economy. They drive our society, they sustain our infrastructures. Yet these industries are the main engine of global warming in the last few decades. Obviously, this doesn't mean that all climate change ever is due to human induced CO2. Scientists know that there are many other factors, including you know, solar activity and things like that. But overwhelmingly, it's, the scientific evidence shows that overwhelmingly it's the primary factor of CO2 emissions. Now, I want to start by, not, well, I, want to, I want to kind of open this issue by mentioning, you must, did you guys watch that Channel 4 documentary um, called The Great Global Warming Swindle? That was a couple of months ago. But this was a, doc, this was a really important documentary because it was, I mean, it's now really been heavily criticized by climate scientists, but it was a kind of chip, typical kind of Channel 4 propaganda job. They had set out to show that global warming was definitely a hoax, absolutely a hoax. And I, I, want to, I want to start from this to kind of deal with the issue of whether this is really questionable or not, because it's something that people still talk about. And this is the graph that charts the, the average global temperature rise. And that's the graph that they, that they used in Channel 4. Now, just to go back, this is the original graph, and that's what they used. You can see that you can see the line there, which goes down, is pretty much much more difficult to see in the original graph. So they basically fudged the image in order to kind of prove a point that global warming is not happening. Blah 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 blah. That there was a the long cooling period. <coughs> and just to hit the point home, I'll talk about the solar issue in a second. <coughs> 
Um, the New Scientist has another graph which charts based on normal changes that would be going on on the basis of, of without CO2 emissions, they calculate just, just due to solar activity, just to the, the periodic orbit of the Earth. The green line would show most probably where, where, where global temperatures would be, but it should actually be cooling at this point. And the other, the other lines, black and red lines, pretty much show what's happening now. So there clearly is a problem. <laughs> so where are we going to go with, at, these, at these current rates? And according to the, the UN's International Panel on Climate Change, they came up with a rather conservative set of predictions earlier this year for what might happen at current rates of emissions. And what they said was that if we carry on at current rates of emissions, Global average temperature will probably rise to about 6.4 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. In which case, this planet will not be livable. Not just for human beings, but for any species, for plant life, for anything. It just won't happen. <coughs> now, to be honest with you, when I actually heard this, I was completely shocked. I just, I really couldn't believe it. And this is why I keep going on about this, because when you kind of compare the gravity of this kind of statement with the way that the British government, for example, is handling the issue, it doesn't make any sense. In October, earlier this month, John B. Dow in The Guardian reported that Gordon Brown is now turning around quietly, I mean, this was actually leaked from secret documents, was turning around and all his public pronouncements, pronouncements on climate targets. The aim was essentially to kind of reduce CO2 emissions to at least 60%. And they don't even want to do that. They've quietly decided that they're not going to do it. So it really makes you wonder what's happening out there. The problem is, is that even the International Panel on Climate Change, even their, uh, even their projections have been criticised for being too conservative. Now, one of the guys who came out early on in the year when this report was first released was, his name is Dr. David Wasdall. He's a, he's a well-known climate expert, and he's, he was an accredited reviewer of the IPCC report. And he came out when it, just as it, was, as, 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 it, as, as it was published, and he did an interview with the New Scientist, and he said, the findings of this report have been watered down at the last minute by Western government officials. In the last minute, they flew in and they, they revised text line by line certain key points to make them seem less catastrophic. And then they released the report. And he said, as you compare line by line the final report compared with earlier drafts from a year before that scientists had written up, they literally just changed it to make it seem less worrying. And what he basically says is that Everything that was removed concerns the potential for climate, for the climate to change faster because of positive feedbacks in the climate system. All of those references to positive feedbacks which will accelerate climate change were taken out. And just in the last week, the IPCC has essentially almost confirmed that its old projections were too conservative. I don't know if you've, been, if you've been following this. They just basically said that if you want, if you want to avoid the heating the globe to an average of 3.6 degrees, um, then we have to basically stop greenhouse gas emissions at, we have to stop basically no later than 2015. And by 2050, we have to make sure that all CO2 emissions are reduced by up to 85%. Now, what a number of scientists are now saying is that even what the IPC have just said is also conservative. And that's people from within the IPC. One guy called David Carey, who was a member of the core team that wrote the report that just came out last week, he said, we, have made, we may have already overshot that target. He said, current emissions already are nearing the limit required 
in 2015 to limit, to limit warming to 2 degrees Celsius. <coughs> I want us just to think what it means if we go beyond the 2 degree mark. Forget the 6 degree mark, which is obviously apocalyptic. <coughs> Let's just take the 2 degree mark. According to Tom Burke, who used to advise the government, he was the government, British government advisor on biodiversity for quite a few years. He said that the two degree mark is almost already destined. We've already gone, we've already gone too far. What he said is that basically the minimum, the minimum number, the amount, amount of CO2 in the atmosphere at two degrees is supposed to be 400 parts per million. Now, according to Keith Shine, who's a meteorologist, at the University of Reading, he set about to study what, how much CO2 we actually have. And what he found was that, unnoticed by scientific and political communities, it's risen beyond the 400 degree, 400 ppm mark. It's now 425 parts per million. And again, so that means that the two degree threshold is almost already here. Now, what does that mean? We're talking about fundamental shifts in the way that the world is going to work over the next 20 to 30 years. According to the US National Center for Atmospheric Research, already between 1970 and 2000, 10 to 15% of the Earth was, was experiencing unprecedented rates of drying as a result of global warming. Now what's happening is that because global warming is not just melting the Arctic, it's also melting the glaciers that feed the Asia's largest rivers. Now, the glaciers are basically a natural storage system. And what happens is they release water kind of normally during hot periods, periodically. Now, the shrinking ice sheets means that it's going to aggravate water imbalances, which is going to cause flooding as the melting accelerates. Which, this is going to mean that there's going to be a reduction in river flows and as a result of that, there will be less water around. And the impact is going to basically be on the developing countries mostly, but we are also going to be affected. You can see the figures there, they speak for themselves. What this means is that agriculture will just grind to a halt. People will not be able to grow food. Millions of people will not have access to water, they will not have access to food. We won't be able to escape the repercussions of that. <coughs> The next issue I want to talk about is the question of peak oil. <clears throat> Another crisis emerging, which is also directly linked to fossil fuels. <clears throat> now, as we know, industrial civilization is based fundamentally on conventional oil. It's not just conventional oil, conventional oil and gas, and also there is still, we're still relying on some coal <clears throat> and some other sources as well but primarily is looking at conventional oil, then gas, then coal. Now without these hydrocarbon energies, obviously industrial civilization just wouldn't work, it wouldn't function. It would simply collapse to transportation, agriculture, modern medicine, national defense, water distribution, the production of basic technologies would just be impossible without oil. <coughs> now the basic rules for the discovery of oil were first laid down by a man called M. King Hubbard, who was a world-renowned geophysicist. And what he said is that basically, it goes through these three key stages. First, you've got, um, you know, production obviously begins at zero. Now, the second stage is, it, part, it reaches a peak which cannot be surpassed. Now, at that peak, it reaches about 50% of, of reserves being used up you get this point when it's literally geophysically more difficult to extract petroleum. The petroleum is still there, 50% is still there. But geophysically, it becomes more difficult to get it out. So production starts to decline inevitably after the 50% point until the resource is finally depleted. Now what that graph shows is that it basically, you've got, in the, you've got the purple boxes, 
showing, basically indicating the oil, the oil reserves that have been discovered. Now, as we can see, since 1940 to 2000, the number of reserves that have been discovered is declining systematically. <coughs> And the forecast for discovery, in, in terms of extrapolating how much can be discovered, is pretty pessimistic. There's not very much at the moment that we can see coming on the line. If you, if you look at the blue line going, kind of going diagonally towards the top, that's basically rising rates of consumption, because you've got China, you've got India as well, who are industrializing very fast. Consumption is increasing. Now what happens is that Peak oil means is that there'll come a point where the amount of consumption is not being met by the supply. And that is when you're going to hit this gigantic crisis when you will not be able to continue to meet the needs of your industrial civilization. <coughs> the question is, of course, is when, does, when is this going to happen? And there is a debate amongst oil industry experts. You've got the pessimists and you've got the optimists. Now, about 20 years ago, it was possible you had optimists who were basically saying that, you know, don't worry, you know, we've got so much oil left, you know, that really we've got hundreds and hundreds of years, you know, and, and obviously the pessimists were kind of saying, you know, maybe we've got 20 to 30 years. Now the debate has kind of decreased, which kind of illustrates where we're at. The optimistic people basically say that, you know, we've got about 30 years left. British Petroleum published a report a couple of months ago, basically optimistically saying that not to worry, we've got 30 years left. Now to me, 30 years is nothing to be optimistic about. 30 years is a pretty short period of time. But they were saying, you know, 30 years, you know, we've still got time, but okay, fair enough. Now the pessimists, and interestingly, the pessimists are now getting more and more support in the oil industry. Not necessarily amongst the big companies, but amongst the experts who are doing analysis. And what they're basically saying is that we've got about four years left. It's going to happen in about 2010. One of the big centers in London is the Association for the Study of Peak Oil. And um, they basically, they, they, they variably put the peak between 2000 and 2010. And a number of them kind of vary. Now what makes their work more credible is that some of their data derives from this database called, uh, which is held by this Geneva-based gigantic company called Petro Consultants. And the Petro Consultants database is the most comprehensive for data on oil resources outside North America. It's considered so significant that it's not in the public domain. In fact, it's priced at $32,000 a copy. So me and you are no way going to be able to afford it. Now, they basically, the, these two guys, Dr. Colin Campbell, who used to work for BP, by the way, and, and his colleague, they based their analysis on that data. <coughs> That's the data that the oil companies are, 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 are using to come up with their own statistics. <coughs> Both of these crises, climate change and peak oil, are indelibly linked to the questions of food and water, as I mentioned. I mentioned food and water already. I want to talk about food scarcity in particular, just to illustrate how badly this is affecting us and how it's affecting us now. There's been a number of studies which have already talked about the link between climate change and food scarcity. The Met Office's Hadley Center did a study that was funded by the government, actually, and they've already said, you know, millions of lives will be threatened as a result of climate change because of the inability to, complete, to continue growing food due to drought. <coughs> Again, a number of other studies have confirmed this. The, interest, but the most important thing I want to talk about is not just the question of climate change and peak oil. Of course, if, if the oil goes, then the ag modern agricultural system won't be able to sustain itself. If climate change becomes a you know, continues out of control. Again, the droughts will make it very, very difficult. What I'm pointing out is that on its own terms, the modern agribusiness industry, which is a hierarchical corporate dominated industry, it uses very, very intensive methods which are destructive of the environment, destructive of the soil. They don't, they don't have any respect 
for indigenous or traditional methods of agriculture, many of which have been developed over centuries. These methods are basically eroding the soil systematically and decreasing the fertility of the soil. As a result of these, this process, it's now known, a number of studies have shown, I mentioned the, said this, this, this group called SAGE, who are operating out of the University of Wisconsin-Madison in America. Um, they've done a study of how much land is being used, and pretty much all the fertile land is being used. There is not much land left, and the land that is being used is being exhausted. So we have a problem. So the problem here that I want to that is, is not is not so much the question of global population. It's, it's the question of who is dominating the agri agribusiness industry and why are they using such devastating methods to produce food on a mass scale, rather than using other alternative, more ecologically sound methods. As a result of this, for the last four or five years, in fact more than that, since really the beginning of, of this new of the new millennium. Raw grain production has basically been declining. It's been declining quietly as we speak. Uh, I just want to give you an example of how the mainstream media deals with this kind of stuff. It was about three weeks ago, I, was, I turned on the news. It was just morning news. Maybe the news, I can't remember. <laughs> but um, the story was that Britons are going to have to pay more money to eat their fry ups. That was, that was the headline. It was kind of like a humor, humor story. <coughs> And they interviewed a lot of these guys, these kind of builder guys, who were kind of in these cafes eating like egg and beans and toast and stuff, and you know, bacon and all the rest of it, and sausages. And they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And, and they were interviewing them, it was like, so, you know, how do you feel? You know, you're going to have to pay more money, you know, for, 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 the, you know, for sausages and stuff. And they're like, well, you know, I've got, I got, to, got to deal with it, innit? You know, so, like, that, that was the response. Now, within that story, Within about the space of 30 seconds, they mentioned that, by the way, the reason that this is happening is because world grain prices are rising. And what's happening is that the grain that they're feeding like cows and sheep and all the rest of it, because the farmers have to pay more for the grain to feed the animals, it's too, it's too much for them economically. So they're, they're putting their prices up, basically. That's why it's happening. And so the issue of world grain prices rising, and why, why are they rising? They're rising because food production is actually declining. But that wasn't mentioned. That fundamental issue did not get mentioned. Look how the mainstream media frames these issues and trivializes them and almost eclipses them from public consciousness. It's, it's really amazing. It's not a result of, of, of a grand conspiracy. It's the result of, of, of a combination of ignorance and people at the top who would much rather that the public doesn't really know what's going on. <coughs> Finally, and I know you guys are getting tired, I'm sorry for dragging this on, but we're, we're nearing the end of this presentation. Economic Holocaust. The first thing I want to talk about in this respect is the impact of the global economy now as it stands. I've just got a couple of figures there just to give you an idea of how obvious it's now become that the, the global economic system, the neoliberal economic order, has failed. It hasn't delivered its promises. The globalization, globalization is currently happening. The, global, the conventional globalization wisdom operates on the basis of trickle-down theory. It says that if you encourage free markets, completely open and tell everyone to lift up their borders, and allow private finance to flood in. And what will happen is that automatically, all of this investment will generate growth, and that growth will trickle, trickle down throughout society to all, all sectors of society. So the idea is that once people make profit, you know, it kind of lifts all boats. Now, unfortunately, it just hasn't worked that way. According to the United Nations Development Programme, the gap between rich and poor nations has doubled between 1960 and 1989. They say that the rewards of globalization do exist, but those rewards are increasingly spread unequally and inequitably, concentrating power and wealth in a select group of people, nations, and corporations, marginalizing the others. 
I'm talking specifically about a very, a very particular neoliberal economic model that is being imposed by institutions like the IMF, the World Bank, and the WTO on the nations, the developing nations in the South. And I've got this study here from the Center for Economic Policy and Research in Washington. They did a number of interesting studies. In 1999, they focused on Africa. They looked at the growth rates between 1980 and 2000. And what they found was that consistently, African countries subject to IMF structural adjustment packages actually exhibited decreased rates of growth compared to before. So the IMF packages just weren't doing, weren't doing anything, even in terms of growth. They did another study in 2001 called the Scorecard on Globalization. And they looked at the same period, 1980 to 2000, for a whole host of countries out, across the South. And they looked at a number of them. They looked at growth, they looked at life expectancy, they looked at infant and child mortality, <coughs> and education and literacy. And on all of these indicators, the neoliberal economic model had actually retarded these societies in every single way. So the thrust of the argument here is that even on its own terms, this current system, this current economic system, has even failed to deliver even, even, the, even the promise of growth to these, to these, to these southern nations. Now, obviously, I'm sure you people must have been following the news in terms of what's been going on in the economy. Pretty devastating stuff, pretty unpredictable, you might think. But actually, economists were warning about this state of affairs for the last few years. A number of mainstream economists were actually saying that there may actually be a total collapse of the banking system but in 2008. I just want to go over some of what he said, just to give you an idea. I've got, a, I've got a quote there from Professor Brad DeLong, who was writing in August 2007. Um, this was actually just a few months before the current slide in the market actually kicked off. And what was quite interesting is that he had already diagnosed the fundamental issues. He talked about the mortgage house of cards, he talked about the, the, the inability of people to repay these debts. And he talked about the, the fundamental structural problems with the Federal Reserve. And essentially, he predicted that there was no way that within the, the current macroeconomic paradigm, that financial institutions could actually forestall the crisis as it was going to come. If they carried on doing the things the way they were doing it, they wouldn't be able to stop it. And what's really interesting is that this is now becoming a growing recognition amongst mainstream economists in major financial institutions. I just gave, gave you a few quotes from the IMF and from Stephen Roach from Morgan Stanley, who's the chief, the chief economist at Morgan Stanley. And he basically said much the same thing. Both of them have predicted that over the next, few, the next year or few years, due to these twin policies of deregulation and liberalization. These, these are the foundations of what we call the Washington Consensus, the, the, the staple policies that are implemented not only here in the USA and Britain, but also exported around the world as the answer to poverty and the road to, the, the, the road to prosperity. Um, that these, these policies are themselves creating systemic risk and financial instability. And that financial institutions themselves cannot prevent these from happening. They haven't yet taken the step of realizing that actually what we need is a fundamental shift in the very way that these financial institutions operate. <coughs> that's, that's the bad news. That is pretty bad news. But the good news is the good news is, is that there are many, many experts and academics waking up, and we can see it happening. The fact is, is that more than ever, if you do watch the mainstream news, more than at any time in our history, we are increasingly aware of what is wrong with the current system. 
All of these issues that I've raised today, climate change, energy depletion, economic meltdown, these are in your face. These are not new to you. You already know about them. You've read about them in the mainstream press. This is something distinctive, that people are actually aware of the crisis. What hasn't happened is that so far there's been a failure for these different academics and experts and activists to come together and say, let's work together and let's see what this means, because we realize it's a crisis. What's happening is that everyone is approaching it realizing that, that there is a serious issue, that all of these are fundamental issues, but they're approaching it from this com very compartmentalized, fragmented way. And this itself is a symptom of what you might call the old paradigm, the old way of thinking, the old system, a system that, as we can see, is increasingly discredited. The what I'm trying to show is that there is one major conclusion to all of this, that the prevailing social, economic, and political system has failed. It is failing. That we need an alternative is no longer disputable. That there is an alternative is something that many people are now working towards. Now this paradigm, this paradigm shift, is actually taking place as I speak. It's not happening, it's not happening in front of our eyes, but it is happening, and millions of people are actually involved in this paradigm shift. It's emerging spontaneously, loosely from these disparate people coming up with ideas, trying to find solutions to what's going on. I want to give you an idea of what this paradigm shift involves. <clears throat> earlier, earlier in this, in, 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 earlier in the last century, there were, a number, there were two major reports that came out, which actually articulated it in a very, very simple way. You may have heard of the Club of Rome, which one of, they were one of the first institutions to start talking about this question of limits to growth in the 1970s. And they basically articulated a whole program of action that needed to be taken. But one of the things they focused on was this idea of values and our conception of our relationship to nature. And this is what they said. They said that only drastic economic and technological changes on a global level could avoid major and ultimately global catastrophe. But they said these changes themselves will only be possible if fundamental changes in the values and attitudes of human beings occur, such as a new ethic and a new attitude towards nature. Now this recognition is now a growing recognition across the board. The United Nations did a report in 2000 um, with, their, with their environmental program. 850 experts, dozens of UN agencies, 30 environmental institutes basically came out and they said, the present course is clearly unsustainable. Postponing action is not an option. But they called for a shift in values away from material consumption. Without such a shift, they warned, environmental policies can only affect marginal improvements. So what we're seeing is that the shift in values comes tied with a shift in our mode of social organization. These things have to come together. There are basically four key kind of lines of inquiry that all of us need to think about, all of us need to get involved in, need to actively start exploring. And there are already very, very interesting developments in all of these key areas. As you can see, the slide is pretty bare compared to my, my other slides. I was coming to the end of my preparation, so I apologize for that. On the first point, the idea of participatory economics. There are some really, really interesting ideas coming out now from economists in the United States. There's two guys, you may have heard of them, Michael Albert, who runs uh, Zenet, and um, Robin Harnell, radical economists, who invented this idea of participatory economics. And what they're arguing is that it's not just about redistributing wealth, it's about reconfiguring inherently unstable manner in which wealth is manufactured and speculative. And what they're saying is that we need to start thinking about ways in which local people can be directly involved in controlling their, their economy. 
some really interesting ideas. Point two, renewable energies. What we need to do, without a doubt, is shift, transfer as swiftly as possible to renewable energies. This is not an option. And this is actually completely viable. There was a study done in London by the Institute of Science and Society. And what they did, they came up with this model called green economic growth. And they studied a whole variety of renewable energies, from solar energy to you know, wind turbines, um, and all, kind, all different kinds of things. And it was a very extensive report. And they released it, I think it was late last year. And um, they basically said that this is not only a viable strategy, it's a much more economically sound and efficient strategy. And it's one that is more likely to be more just on a social basis. <coughs> the vision that they were offering was of a post-industrial society that is truly free of CO2 emissions. Now contrast that with what I mentioned before, the Garden Report from John B. Dow, where Gordon Brown is now saying that let's just forget you know, the, climate, the climate aims that we've already got. Even the aims that they had already were fundamentally problematic. If you look at what the Stern Report was saying, you remember the Stern Report, which focused on you know, how climate change is going to be a huge cost to our economy, that we need to do something about it. Do you know what, they you know what he actually recommended? He said that the minimum level of CO2 emissions that we can stabilize at, and, and we can afford to do that, is 550 parts per million. Now we've already said that 400 ppm is when, once you pass that mark, you start getting into the, 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 the area of rapid, dangerous climate change. And this guy is saying that, don't worry, everything's fine, you know, we'll, we've got the next 20 odd years, and we can keep going, keep pumping it out, and um, we, should be, we should be okay. What does that mean? It means that somewhere, a decision was actually made that at that level of, of, of global average temperature, at that level of devastation that would be created, primarily in the developing world, that's fine, that's acceptable. That's an acceptable degree because we have to maintain this current way of working. The third question of the decentralization of political power. <coughs> now again, there are many ideas. I'm not, I'm not coming and advocating that this is, here is a set of political solution, this is what we need to do. There are many new ideas about what we can do. A book came out a couple of years ago by George Monbiot called The Age of Consent. George Monbiot, the uh, well-known environmentalist who writes for The Guardian. Now, this is actually a really interesting book because in this book, he described a whole new set of ideas for establishing the idea of a global people's parliament. He talked about using the internet to establish communication across different countries. <coughs> He talked about all kinds of grassroots and local mechanisms that people could start doing now to encourage participation in political activity, to create a system, a new system of activity now, even as we speak, regardless of what the powers that be want to do. Let's start creating now. This was, this was his idea. That's a book I would strongly recommend. I mean, there were some ideas that maybe you might think are outlandish, but I think it's time to start thinking as outlandishly as we can, given the scale of what we face. The fourth question of, the, of culture, a new ethical culture. All of these first three issues need to be linked to the creation of a culture <coughs> that recognizes not only human interconnectedness, but the interconnectedness of human life with all life and with the natural world, rather than seeing humankind as some kind of you know, unconstrained overlord for whom the earth is just this this tool of you know, kind of unlimited, this resource of self-gratification. What all of these thinkers, what all of these experts and scientists are pointing towards is that a more, a more accurate perception of reality, a conception grinded in, grounded in science, is one that the human condition is fundamentally embedded in nature, it's not separate from nature, and that these non-materialistic ethical values that support the protection and enhancement of life actually reflect our fundamental relationship to nature, to reality. 
just to give a few names of some of the guys who are working on these kind of issues. The first guy, Amitai Sioni, is an Israeli-American sociologist. Now this guy, he served as a senior professor at Harvard Business School. He was also a former senior advisor to the White House. He's not a left-wing nutcase. This guy was up there, working with the top echelons. And this is what he said. He said, challenged is the entrenched, utilitarian, rationalistic, individualistic, neoclassical paradigm, which is applied not merely to the economy, but also increasingly to the full array of social relations. He said that there must be a key role for moral values within economies. And that quote is from his book called The Moral Dimension Towards New Economics. Closer to home, the second guy, James Robertson, is a British, British, British author. Now this guy, again, very interesting, he worked as an aide to Prime Minister Howard Macmillan, you know, a couple of decades ago. He then went on to work in the Cabinet Office, and he then went, went on to work for the MOD, Ministry of Defence. He's now a consultant for large organizations like the World Health Organization, and even for the EU. And this is what he wrote in 1990 in, in his book called Future Wealth. He said, unlike both the capitalist and socialist versions of conventional economics, the 21st century economy must be based on recognition that people are moral beings, whose freedom should not be narrowly bound by impersonal parameters laid down by either the market or the state. He said the new economics must transcend the materialistic assumptions of the conventional economics, that economic life is reducible to production and consumption. And I'm going to continue quoting. He said it must reinterpret the manipulative concern of conventional economics with the production and redistribution of wealth and allocation of resources, which is all mainstream economics talks about. It has to convert that into something else into a developmental concern with how to enable people to meet their needs, develop themselves, and enhance the resource in, resources and qualities of the natural world. Finally, David Coulter, again equally interesting. This guy worked for, for, for years with the US Agency for International Development. But it was his, it was his very experience with working for USAID that actually made him realize that the way things are going is just not working. Because he was seeing firsthand that as much as they worked to alleviate the suffering of, of people across the globe, it just got worse. So eventually he left. And what he said is that he wrote, he's now a best-selling author of a huge number of books on corporations and how they function. He's, even, he's considered the leader of uh, one of the leaders of the anti-globalization movements. And he's got a whole set of organizations and movements with millions of people around him kind of reading his books and trying to take his ideas into the mainstream. And this is what he says. He says that the global economic system is basically based on these kind of unproven reductionist and materialist assumptions about life and nature, which he says almost amount to a fundamentalist theology. He says the economic profession serves almost as a priesthood. It champions values that demean the human spirit. It assumes an imaginary world divorced from reality. Money is its sole measure of value in its practices. They advance policies that are deepening social and environmental disintegration only. The crucial point here is his statement. It assumes an imaginary world divorced from reality. The current global system is not based on reality. The assumptions underlying this system, the assumptions about human nature, the assumptions about the natural environment, have nothing to do with reality. These are institutionalized mythologies. Mythologies that, have, that were associated with an old way of thinking, an old mechanistic science that has now been superseded by a new science, a new science across different disciplines, in physics and economics, in medicine, And I want to close on, on this, uh, on really one final point that you might consider rather obscure. 
which is, which is physics. Well, I threw this in at the end, but I really, really wanted to talk about this, just because it's something that really interests me, personally. And there wasn't any space, but I thought, what the hell, let's throw it in. You might think, what the hell, why am I talking about Bell's theorem, you're wondering? Well, Bell's theorem in quantum mechanics, it was a mathematical demonstration by a physicist, John Stuart Bell. And it's been confirmed by a long series of experiments, especially those by a guy called Dr. Alain Aspect in the 1970s and 1982. Now, what Bell's theorem showed, and I'm not going to go into the details because of the time issues, but what they showed was that subatomic particles, once they come into contact, they continue to behave as if they are still connected or correlated, even when they're separated across space and time. And did a number of experiments to prove them, and to put it very crudely, they literally just got some photons, got them to go together, and then when they were separate, observed their behavior, and they found that when you change the spin of one, the other would also change spin, as if it was connected to the other one. Now, a number of physicists, major physicists, not just kind of people on the outskirts of the the people right at the hard core of the, of the, of the major paradigm shifting <coughs> findings of quantum mechanics have realized that there are huge philosophical implications of these findings and that they challenge our conventional assumptions about physical reality in fundamental ways. One of them is Dr. David Bohm, who passed away recently, who used to be at, um, used to be at Birkbeck College. And he worked with Albert Einstein in at Princeton University. And he basically said that what this means is that everything in the universe seems to be in a kind of total rapport. So that whatever happens is related to everything else. The idea of non-locality. Quantum physicists take non-locality for granted. It's a normal part of the way they do things. But it hasn't, the findings of quantum physics have not translated into other spheres of our, of our understanding of how the world works. Another famous physicist by the name of Wolfgang Pauli, who received a Nobel laureate for discovering the exclusion principle, he also agreed that the Bell theorem did indeed imply that the universe is fundamentally interconnected across space-time. Another physicist, if you want to read more about this issue, Dr. Fridtjof Capra, who wrote about this specifically, he wrote a book called The Tale of Physics. Again, it's a best-selling book. Millions of people have read this book. He argued that the findings of quantum physics correlate closely to descriptions of reality recorded by Eastern mystics. So these are fundamental paradigm shifts taking place across disciplines that we don't even know about, we don't even hear about. But they're changing the way that we need to think about the world. They're showing that the world is not just this fragmenting you know, collection of competitive materialistic entities scrambling over resources. The shift that is taking place in the social and physical sciences suggests that we are creatures whose survival as a species does indeed depend on mutual cooperation, on harmony, on respect for our environment and for one another, on the recognition of ethical and spiritual values that see more to life than merely unlimited materialistic self-gratification, but see joy in simply being with one another in a world of beauty and wonder. This paradigm shift clearly has huge implications. It means that behaving less materialistically, with more balance, in tune with our environment, on the basis of values like social justice and compassion, all of this actually represents a way of life that is in harmony with life and nature, that indeed truly reflects our relationship to reality. And the good news is that millions of people around the world are waking up to this. It's up to us to take this message and communicate it to our friends, to our families, to our work colleagues, and to let that message spread so that it coheres. It's not just a paradigm shift in our minds, but it's a real social change.